Thanks for coming. My name is Steve Davis. I'm a curator here at the Whitliff Collections. It's my honor to welcome you all here tonight as we celebrate East Texas and story and song with our three distinguished guests. So uh, the program will have a little bit of music, a couple of presentations, and then once everybody's done, we'll have a Q&A at the end. And after we have those questions and hopefully some answers, uh, we'll have a book signing right here at the table. About <laughs> and, uh, we, we had some last minute negotiations that kind of fell through, but we'll do the best we can. And if you haven't seen, we have books and CDs and DVDs for sale around the corner. Christmas is approaching rapidly. Signed books make wonderful gifts, as you know. As does Christmas with the dead. It's <laughs> Exactly. And so what I'm going to do is try to quickly introduce uh, our special guests and get the hell out of the way so we can let the fun begin. I'd also like to recognize a couple of uh, special folks we have here in attendance tonight. We have uh, Jacob Croft Botter, who took the photographs right, in Running the River, Secrets of the Sabine. And if you've seen that book, you've seen that Jacob's photos merge really well with Wes's brilliant writing. And I think we'll see a few of the photos with your presentation or a few of Jacob's photos. And, um, and we will have Jacob, who has graciously agreed to join us for the book signing, so you can get your books signed by Wes and Jacob both uh, this evening. <laughs> we also have with us Karen Lansdale, I'm pleased to say, the wife of Joe, his power partner, uh, the multi-talented Karen, who's a brilliant editor and author in her own right. If you've seen this gorgeous photograph we have of Joe deep in the piney woods, it's Karen who took that photograph. So, Karen, thanks for coming. It's good to have you here. And I'd like to say it's our pleasure to have Casey Lansdale join us tonight. <laughs> Casey is a product of the multi-talented Lansdale family. She is a fine writer who published her first story at age eight and recently edited a collection of stories for publication titled Impossible Monsters. Is that for sale this evening? Uh, yes, it is. Actually. Yes? Okay, great. And, uh, and Katie, uh, Casey did confirm earlier that she uh, recently completed uh, work on a novel that's going through its final editing now, so she'll soon have a novel out. But in addition to being a writer, Casey is also a celebrated musical talent. She grew up listening to a wide variety of music with her loving parents, and she played her first gig in Nacogdoches at age 18. Since then, she's been an unstoppable force. Her new CD, Restless, was produced by Grammy Award winner John Carter Cash from that Carter family and that Cash family. And it's, that is available for sale here tonight. I just want to read you a quick portion of this Ray review in the Music News Nashville that uh, praised Casey's CD as a stunning product of that great state of Texas that soars like a butterfly into the stratosphere. So I probably don't need to add that Casey's been pretty busy since that CD's come out. She's been watching the album and its singles move up the charts. She's seen her songs appear in various films, and we just learned tonight uh, yet another film is going to feature her music. And she just recently completed a nine-month-long tour in support of the album, and she is under strict doctor's orders to rest her voice. So here uh, I am. <laughs> She is making one exception tonight that we're not supposed to tell anybody about. She's going to um, sing a special song, one inspired by her father's work. So, Casey, I just want to say congratulations on all your well-deserved success. And thanks for joining us this evening. Thank you. We also have with us tonight one of the most talented emerging writers in Texas, Mr. Wes Ferguson. Wes grew up in Liberty City, graduated from Sabine High School, which is just down the road from Gladewater, which is where Joe was born and raised. There's a shrine there. <laughs> no, no, there isn't. <laughs> there should be. Um, wow, I lost my track of thought. Okay. Um, Wes took a journalism degree uh, from UT Austin in 2004, and since then has been tearing up the world of journalism, sometimes literally, I think. Um, those of you who are readers in this area may know Wes's tenure at the Hayes County Free Press, where the newspaper won a 
war award for uh, general excellence, I believe, for the state of Texas, which is a great testament to your leadership of that paper. I've been a big fan of Wes's journalism, and it's been a real delight to see him turn his talent to writing books now. And Wes's book that we're featuring tonight, the highly acclaimed Running the River, Secrets of the Sabine, is a revelation. For those of you familiar with the classic Texas River book, John Graves' Goodbye to a River, you probably know that Graves is often regarded as a something of a Hemingway-esque figure in Texas letters. And so I just want to say if John Graves is our Ernest Hemingway, then Wes Ferguson is our Hunter S. Thompson. <laughs> because this is a gonzo account of life along the Sabine. It's a hell of a good book. And among those who have praised Wes's book, fittingly enough, is Joe Lansdale. And you'll see Joe's great quote about the book uh, when you go over and buy your copy uh, after the program to get it signed. So Notice Wes, how he said buy. <laughs> <laughs> so Wes, it's great to have you here. Uh, thanks for joining us at the conference. And now I'd like to salute our champion mojo storyteller, Mr. Joe Lansdale. Joe is a literary virtuoso, the author of nearly 50 novels, the winner of the Edgar Award, nine Bram Stoker Awards, the World Horror Convention Grand Master Award. Too many awards to count, actually. But I want to mention just one other award. Um, in 2006, Joe won Italy's Grinzani Cavour Literature Prize for Lifetime Achievement. This is a very prestigious award that previously went to seven consecutive Nobel laureates before, I, I ruined it. I before ruined Joe it. snapped that screen. <laughs> that's right. Nobel. And those of you who know Joe know that he's more than just one of the greatest literary talents from this state or any other state. He is also one of the most generous people you will ever know, a man deeply respected and beloved by his fans and his fellow authors, including the many, many writers he has personally inspired over the years. I can speak for myself in this regard, and I know that Wes feels the same way, as do many others. Uh, and we have Mike here, who was talking about this earlier, who have benefited from Joe's encouragement, support, and wisdom. Those of you who are Facebook friends with Joe, um, my wife is, and she talks, and I've heard other people talk about these writing tips that you post nearly every day, which uh, really inspire so many people. Um, uh, we'd like to say that one of the enduring monuments you'll find to Joe's great generosity is right here at the Whitliffe Collections. We are the home to a major Joe R. Lansdale archive, which exists because Joe has very generously and graciously donated his papers to this collection. Here you'll find a treasure trove of manuscripts, correspondence, publicity materials, reviews, interviews, clippings, prized artifacts, numerous foreign editions of Joe's books, and um, you'll find Interesting things like this word processor that Casey destroyed when she was a little girl. <laughs> have on exhibit right now. This great skull shirt. So if you haven't seen this display we have, which just shows a small sliver of Joe's archive, we have it uh, on view. It's around the corner uh, near where the food and book cells are. What Joe's assembled here is a major literary archive that nourishes and inspires current and future generations of scholars, students, writers, really anyone interested in a good story. And I also want to add that um, those of you who have followed Joe's career know that he's quickly becoming an international literary superstar, and Hollywood is finally catching on to what a gold mine Joe's novels are. Um, his novels adapted to film include the cult classic Bubba Hotep. Has anyone here seen Bubba Hotep? <laughs> what do you think of that movie? Yeah. Uh, the latest novel to be adapted to film is Cold in July which was released uh, this year, nominated for a grand jury prize at the Sundance Film Festival. This film also received a five minute long standing ovation at the Cannes Film Festival. It's winning prizes at film festivals all over the world and it just came out on DVD and that's also for sale here this evening, I believe. yes. So, you know, once uh, we got in touch with Joe and he agreed to come here today, we've been so excited about this. And Joe, I just want to say uh, in closing that it really is such an honor for us to host you. You are one of the most breathtaking and original literary talents this state has ever produced. And you're one of the prized authors at the Willow Collections. We are so grateful for your donations. And I 
hope that those of you who feel the same way I do will join me in thanking Joe and welcoming Joe to the Whitlove Collection. Thank you. I'm here because nepotism is real. <laughs> and uh, of course, there's a novel my father wrote called Edge of Dark Water. And I was actually on tour for my album Restless. And I was in New York and we were um, doing separate work, but my father happened to be in New York as well. And so his agent said, well, you know, why don't you come to this meeting that we have? and then we'll all go out to lunch after. And I said, sure, you know, and I'll go kind of lurk in the corner and try not to, you know, make a scene. So as we're there, there's a long table, there's about 50 people in the boardroom, and I'm in the corner trying not to be noticed, and all of a sudden, over the intercom, comes my music blaring. <laughs> and I was both thrilled and mortified simultaneously, <laughs> which is a unique feeling. And his agent says, why aren't we doing something with this? Why aren't we doing cross promotion? And I said, all right, so the book that was there at the moment was Edge of Dark Water, so I went home and I wrote a song by the same title. Now, if you have read the book, and this is not a spoiler because it's one chapter in, there's a girl and she's dead because it's a Lansdale novel and that's just how it is. So chapter one, she's dead in the bottom of the Sabine River, singer sewing machine tied to her ankle, and they want to know why. I felt like kind of unfair that she's dead. She didn't really get to tell her story. And everybody else got 300 something pages. So when I wrote this song, I wrote the song that I thought Mae Lynn would like told. And again, Edge of Dark Water. Yeah. 
Wow, Casey Lansdale, everybody. Like Steve said, I'm Wes Ferguson. I'm the author of Running the River, Secrets of the Sabine. Uh, first, I just wanted to thank Steve Davis and the Will of Collections for inviting me to participate in such a fun event in this beautiful space. Um, for this book, um, my collaborator was Jacob Croft Botter. His photographs will be on display here in a minute. And the book is about the Sabine River, which starts near Dallas, snakes through the piney woods of northeast Texas, hits up with the Louisiana border, and then goes south into the Gulf of Mexico. And if you are familiar with Joe Lansdale's work, then you already know a thing or two about the Sabine, because it features prominently in many of his books and short stories. Where we're from, the river has kind of a bad reputation. It's known for uh, snakes and mosquitoes, the dead bodies that wash up occasionally on the banks, and the, the water is really muddy and brown. In uh, one of Joe's books, he calls it, he describes it as the color of poisoned coffee. Um, I grew up near the Sabine River, but never gave it much thought until one day I was driving into town, going across the Sabine River Bridge, and I saw the water flowing past and saw where it kind of disappeared around a bend, and I wondered what might exist around that bend. Um, so Jacob and I borrowed a boat and we set out to find out. For my reading, I'm going to uh, read a passage. Jacob and I had already traveled the upper portion of the river through the Piney Woods. Now we've driven down to the Texas-Louisiana border with Jacob's dad, Henry, and we're getting ready to unload and depart for a week-long trip to the Gulf of Mexico. At midday, the forest parted, and we arrived at the boat launch on the Louisiana bank. Then our trip almost ended before it began. We were gathering our gear and transferring it into the boat when an old man ambled toward us on his way to the concrete ramp. His fishing pole bobbed to the shuffle of his steps. He was a withered old fellow, a river rat, with a gray beard, cut off jean shorts, and a head of scraggly white hair in need of scrubbing. The man stopped to inspect our nice new boat and then he inspected us. He didn't like what he saw. Not planning to go very far, the man asked. Jacob and I glanced at our mounds of camping gear. Dry, box, dry boxes packed with provisions, bed rolls, a tent, a couple of coolers, and two extra cans of gasoline filled the boat. Obviously, we were well equipped for a week-long expedition. Was this fellow being sarcastic? Uh, what do you mean, Jacob asked. Are y'all not planning to go very far, the man repeated, his tone bracing for an argument. He picked at his beard and waited for a reply. Well, sure we are, Jacob said. We're going all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. Not in that boat you're not, the man declared. There ain't no water. I nearly dropped the ice chest I was holding when I swung to look at the river beyond the boat ramp. A tangle of scrubby green trees and bushes lined the opposite bank. The sheet of brown water was saturated by mud, sand, and tiny particles of decaying trees and other plant matter. Then I noticed a more troubling sign. Large yellow spots dotted the water like submerged islands. Those spots, I realized, were sandbars lying just inches below the surface. He had a point. The river was low, very low. You won't make it a mile, the man continued. I should know. I was raised on this river. He volunteered ba more bad news. Earlier that week, he said, a team of researchers from a place called Texas University <laughs> had tried and failed to conduct a survey of the freshwater mussels that, in, that inhabit the Sabine. The researchers were unable to, na to navigate the low water and were forced to abandon their project. He told us that a couple of miles downstream from the boat launch, a solid pile of rocks obstructed the entire river. If we even made it that far, which he doubted, we would only be marooned on the rocks and would be forced to carry our boat overland. Jacob's dad, Henry, was listening intently. Say, Jake, why don't y'all call this whole thing off, Henry said. Come back another time. Jacob didn't say a word. He walked down to the river to get a better look. There, two people rode four-wheelers on dunes where the river had receded to reveal a bright, sandy beach. The roar of the people's gas-powered engines carried through the still air. By then, I was ready for the doomsayer to mind his own business. 
Instead, he stood beside the boat, looking pleased with himself, and Jacob and I were faced with a very big decision. It was not an option to put in a little farther downstream. We wouldn't come upon another boat ramp for 60 miles, and by then we would have bypassed more than half our journey. Jacob walked back from the beach. There was more talk of canceling. As father and son deliberated the best course of action, carefully weighing risks and rewards, I felt a, pan a sense of panic growing inside. We had been planning this trip for months. More than that, we were jeopardizing our effort to explore a river that is often overlooked and sometimes maligned, but serves a vital role in the regional environment. There was no way we could back out now. I was sure of that. First, Henry had to be convinced. I hatched a new plan. There's a highway bridge only 10 miles downriver, I told him. We'll be there in a couple hours. You could drive over and wait for us to come by, and when we do, we'll let you know if we think we can keep going or not. This, e this seemed to ease Henry's mind a little. My next objective, to get the boat off the trailer and into the water. Let's take a test run so we can see for ourselves, I said to Jacob. He walked down to the river a couple more times, thinking it over in the October sun. We could hear the roar of the four-wheelers and the occasional redneck yelp, and eventually Jacob agreed to take a test run. We unloaded our supplies from the boat and backed it down the ramp and into the water, then eased our way downstream. I stuck my paddle into the water to gauge the river's depth and struck bottom about two and a half feet below the surface, almost impossibly shallow. Soon, though, the paddle's tip couldn't reach the riverbed in the ever-deepening water. We passed a young fisherman who was trolling up the river toward the boat ramp. I asked him how far he'd gone. About a mile, he answered. You have any problems? Not except that I hit a stump and broke my prop. <laughs> a broken propeller posed a hazard for boat motorists any time of year. I was sitting at the front of the boat, and I turned around to face Jacob to ask him what he thought. Let's go for it, he said. We sped upstream to the boat ramp and hastily reloaded our gear before we could change our minds. Jacob had taken charge of the meals, and he packed enough food to last two weeks. As long as we didn't sink the boat and no wild hogs discovered our cache, we would not go hungry. Jacob's dad was more concerned that we would be stranded on one of the low places the old man had warned us about. What if it gets to nightfall and I still don't see you? Henry asked. You'll see us, Jacob said. Henry picked up a chunk of concrete rubble beside the boat ramp. He dumped the heavy block in the river to clean the mud away and placed it near the bow of the boat beside my feet. If I'm not there when you get there, Henry said, leave the rock so I'll know you went by. Dad, Jacob began to protest, but I, but I immediately agreed to hold on to the piece of concrete, anything to get us down the river. When we set off again, the scrawny old man was squatting by the bank. We had ignored his advice, and now he was ignoring us. It occurred to me that I should stop and ask him a few questions to hear more about his life on the Sabine, but at that moment, I wanted nothing more to do with him. Our journey was underway. And from there, as we took off, it was very shallow, and we kept thudding against the sandbars, and we have to get out and tug ourselves back to deeper spots. But eventually, it deepened, and we came around a strange bend where something pretty funny happened. <laughs> because there were so many twists and bends in the river, it did not take long to stop noticing them until we came around one that was taller than the rest. The high, far-off bluff created a kind of balcony where four people were sitting in a row of lawn chairs overlooking the water, as though they had purchased tickets to a matinee show. Come to think of it, the Sabine River was probably the only show on that lazy afternoon on the western edge of Louisiana. I swear I'm not making up what happened next. We waved, and they waved back, so we decided to stop and visit for a moment. Just as we were pulling onto the sandbar beneath their bluff, a burst of gunfire exploded in our ears. The river plop plopped behind us. A warning shot. The gunfire echoed across the water. Was that aimed at us? I asked. We ducked in our boat and froze, not sure what to do. Soon we heard a shout from the tall, off, from the tall bluff. Sorry for shooting at y'all. I thought you was my brother. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob shook his head and muttered, I'm not sure that makes it any better. <laughs> then he yelled to the people just out of sight. Can we come up there and talk to y'all? They didn't answer, so I yelled, so I hollered louder. Hey, can we come talk to y'all? Sure, they replied. The voices sounded friendly, not like the kind of people who would shoot a trespasser on sight. I scrambled up the loose dirt bank and introduced myself. To my surprise, they knew who I was. 
having read a series of stories I had written about the Sabine River for the newspaper in Longview, a three-hour drive to the northwest. I was wondering when we'd see you down here, said the shooter, a shirtless man named John Flack. Tattoos adorned his arms and chest, and his jeans were tucked into his boots. A 22 rifle lay across his lap. Sorry for shooting at y'all, he repeated. My brother has a boat just like yours. <laughs> That's okay, I replied, not wishing to offend a trigger-happy stranger. What have y'all been up to? We was out here shooting turtles, said his wife, Kathy. I got one. Then she gestured toward her husband. He ain't got nothing. I shot three. Their children could be heard playing and laughing at a house that sat farther inland from the bluff. It's peaceful out here, John said. Till you decide to start shooting everything, his wife corrected. Their friend Corey Ducote looked at me and chuckled. I can't believe y'all got shot at your first damn day on the river. <laughs> we, visited, we visited for a minute, long enough for Jacob to take a few photographs, but we couldn't stick around long because Henry was waiting for us. When we came to the highway bridge near the tiny unincorporated lumber town of Bon Weir, Jacob's dad was sitting on a fallen log in the shade. He had been waiting for three long hours. Some redneck was trying to talk to me, he grumbled. Henry had explained that his son and a friend were traveling downriver from the previous boat ramp around 10 miles upstream. That's a long way, the man replied. Took us eight hours in an inner tube. <laughs> Float in the muddy old Sabine in a tube? That was too much. I told him, I don't even want to talk to you. <laughs> the evening sun cast long, slanting shadows from the bridge. Henry grabbed the chunk of concrete rubble from the boat and tossed it onto the bank. And after extracting a promise from Jacob to call him every couple of days, he said goodbye and pushed us away from shore. Thank you. People say, just make that stuff up. No, I don't. <laughs> Those people are real. I think it was uh, Jack Kerouac when he came across and on the road, he actually crosses the river and he says it was the kingdom of the snake. And uh, when I was growing up, it certainly was like that. So, man, I really enjoyed that. Those are my peeps. Yeah. I actually was one of those that went down the Sabine in an inner tube. I did. What we did, we got like a burlap sack and we made us a little seat in it and we'd sit in it. You know, like that. And I remember seeing water moxins swimming and everything, you know. So it was, it was exciting. We went down it three years in a row, but the inner tube, that was the big year, you know. <laughs> but I, I pretty much always written about East Texas, but it didn't start out like that because I wanted to be normal. <laughs> I wanted to write about New York or Los Angeles or someplace where sophisticated people live. And uh, so I started out like that when I was about 21. I started writing. I sold my first piece when I was 21, but it was nonfiction. I sold every nonfiction piece I wrote, but then I decided I wanted to write fiction. And I always remember that I, was, uh, I worked in the rose fields. My wife and I both did. We hauled hay. We did the usual you know, country jobs that a lot of us grew up doing. And uh, Karen, on the other hand, was from San Antonio and was much more of the sophisticated level. So she married it down. You know? <laughs> but uh, you know, we, we did all those kind of different hard, oddball jobs. And, but in the meantime, one year, when I was working for the rose fields, the weather got really bad. I mean, really bad. And there was no rose field work. And Karen, at that time, had a job working in a giant freezer where she wore uh, one of these, these uh, suits. Well, kind of like a, a, for cold air or whatever. And uh, so she did that. And she said, look, you know what? It's, it's October. The weather's not going to get any better. So why don't you just spend the next three months writing fiction? Of course, I'd been writing, you know, every time, chance I got. But I thought, <coughs> wow, that's not very smart. <laughs> I get to stay home and write. You know? <laughs> So she gave me that three months, and I've always thought it was great. But during that three months, I tried to write about New York and Los Angeles. But at that point in my life, I had never been much farther than Lufkin and Longview. <laughs> so I didn't really have the feel. <laughs> and so I kept getting these, these stories back that I had written prior to that. But during this three months, I decided I would just write whatever came to mind. Now, I didn't know any better, so I wrote a complete short story every day. I didn't know you couldn't do that. And after you read them, I realized you couldn't do that. And, uh, but I started sending those out. And I wrote, 
about 90 short stories and eventually got over a thousand rejects on those 90 short stories. It took several years, but there were a lot of different markets back then. You could send one story to 10, 15 different markets. And I also sent them to five or 10 markets that didn't actually buy fiction, but I didn't know that. I was learning. So Dog Digest did not buy science fiction, I discovered. But I sent all of these stories on these, these 90 stories. And during that time, though, that was a big thing for me to learn to write and produce. But I also, in that same time, I read a short story called Crawfish by Ardeth Mayhar. And she lived in East Texas. And it was the first time I had ever read a story where they were talking about East Texas. And it wasn't the first Southern story I'd ever read. But I thought, wow, she's from East Texas. She wrote this. Nobody laughed. They bought it. <laughs> and so from then on, I began to write about what I knew. And as I began to write about what I knew, I got better. Because I knew what I was talking about, very, very simply. I didn't know New York. I didn't know Los Angeles. And I did know East Texas, because I had grown up there in the kingdom of the snake. I had grown up around those people. And many of them are just, you know, the best people ever. We have to say that. We always say that in front. So when we get to the bad stuff. But my, my background, my grandmother came to Texas in a covered wagon. She was born in 1880-something. She nearly was 100 years old when she died. She saw Buffalo Bill's Wild West show in one of its incarnations. You know, Buffalo Bill died, what, 1917, I believe? And he was doing some other shows with other people of after about 1914 or so. They weren't really his Wild West show, but she saw him as a child. And that was one of those things she told me about when, uh, when I was a child. And it was something she had never forgotten. So I, you know, I had that kind of background. My father was 42, I think, when I was born. My mother was in her late 30s. My brother is 17 years older than I am. And so my father, being born in 1909, had a different history than a lot of the other fathers had. My mother had a different history than a lot of the other mothers had in East Texas. So I was getting all these great stories about when they grew up and when my grandmother grew up. And of course, a lot of them were about the Great Depression, because if there was ever an era that had an effect on anybody, it was the Great Depression. People talk about, well, times are hard now. No, no, they're not. Not compared to that. I remember my mother's family having only a bag of onions to eat for about, I think, a month. And they were just a big bag. And they were just, they were frying them. They were eating them raw, whatever. My, my uncle said when they went in the Army, it was the first time they'd had a good meal. And everybody else was complaining about the food. And they thought, man, we've had a good meal. That's how bad it was. But all of these stories, they told me constantly. I heard all of this great material about you know, how people lived then and what they had to go through. So as I began to write, not only was I writing about East Texas, I was moving in that direction to write about the Great Depression. And I've written about it several times, many, many novels about the Great Depression. I also wrote a lot of stuff about the Old West about East Texas, which is not exactly the Old West, but it, it had its element. And so I got all of this from all of these stories and all of these things I grew up with as much as I got from literature. I mean, I read everything. I still do. I read Mark Twain and Jack London and Kipling, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs. You know, all of these people affected me. But what affected me most and how I approached what I wrote was these stories. And where I grew up, people had a somewhat different perspective. Because a lot of people, when they think of Texas, they see it in a totally different way if, than East Texas. East Texas, as we all jokingly say, is behind the Pine Curtain. And it is a different place because it's more Southern than it is Western or Southwestern, but it has elements of that. The people there, uh, they speak somewhat differently. People think we all that are Southern sound just alike, but we don't. I know I can listen to somebody from West Texas and they speak differently. For one thing, East Texans speak faster than most Southerners or most West Texas people, North Texas people. And so to me, all of the language and the way they put things together is important. The way they use language, the way they use the words, and a lot of it comes out of experiences and the, the way that they use metaphors and similes because, for example, I think a lot of it had to do that there were people growing up in East Texas that my father couldn't read or write. Towards the end of his life, he got to where he could kind of dope out the newspaper a little bit. My mom taught him, I taught him some, but he couldn't read or write. And when he was growing up, there were absolutely no alternatives. His father used to beat him with a whip 
when he was eight years old and sent him into the fields to pick cotton. His mother died when he was eight. There's a story about how he rode a, a pinto pony to uh, the place where he was going to pick cotton, fell off, busted, somehow busted his eardrum, and came back, and his father beat him with a horse whip and sent him back to the fields. Interesting thing about that is my father never laid a hand on me, never, never whipped me, never did any of that. He was a guy who did what he had to do to make a living. He was also a very smart man, but not an educated man. So what my parents did is that they tried to find a way to make a living, and my mother bought an old Model T or Model A car, and my dad always wanted to be a mechanic. She says, you take that car apart and put it back together until you can do it blindfolded. And he did, and that's how he became a mechanic. But during that time, too, that he was learning to be a mechanic and working at all these other jobs, he started going to fairs to wrestle and box for money. He did that so they could you know, have a living when they needed it. My mother would say we'd get really bad shape and he would catch a train over in Lindale and ride it underneath. He hoboed and ride it over to Tyler and different places where these events were happening. And she said he nearly always won because he couldn't lose. We needed the money. Because <laughs> what it was done was all comers. And this was kind of the beginning of uh, professional wrestling. That's how it got started was actually these, these carnivals where people would do this, they have a guy and they take on these all these all comers. Anybody that came up and said, look, I think I can beat you, you got your opportunity. And so that's how he did that. So all of those stories and all of those things, all of these East Texas elements have found their way into my work over the years. And I keep going back to that well. Someone once said, several writers have said that you always just, whatever you have in your youth, you constantly mine for your fiction. And I think that's true. And I think that I was very fortunate in that the language that they used, this, these, these metaphors and things that they used, and these similes that they used, like they used to talk, my dad would say, I, he was so hungry he could see cornbread walking on the ground. You know? And they, used, they had things that they, I used to hear that I know what they mean, but nobody now would because that culture has died. Uh, there used to be, uh, I'll stomp a hole in you like a sow's bed. But nobody knows what that is now because hogs, you know, you don't raise them wild like you raise them on concrete now. But they used to, you know, dig a hole and get in that bed. So if somebody would say they were threatening you, they were going to stomp a hole in you like a sow's bed. Or I'll whip you so bad you'll follow a wagon like a dog. Because that's what the dogs used to follow the wagons. You know, they would have them, make them get to the back to follow the wagon. So all of these, these kinds of things, to me, were more impressive than a lot of the stuff that I was growing up with at that time. And I remember when my grandmother and my uncles and my dad, all of my people would sit out under a tree and tell stories. And all the kids were there and they would all go chase fireflies. And I would always kind of creep back and sit under this tree and listen to them talk. And they told some great stories about their family. They told some damn lies too. I mean, you know, there were a lot of lies. But they also brought a lot of folklore uh, to me, things about Billy the Kid and Jesse James and stories that were, you know, popular then when they were young. And so all of this stuff just sort of blended into this gumbo, you know, for me. So when people say, you know, I, I read this stuff and, and it's just such a mixture, that's why. Because I grew up in the 60s, I was one of those liberal guys, you know. And I was one of those guys that was uh, opposed to the Vietnam War and didn't go and nearly went to prison. And just like some of my characters in the Happy Leonard series and things. So, but I was while I, these experiences I was having were later going to lead me to write certain things, so were the experiences that my parents had, that my grandparents had. So to me, East Texas is this wonderful, wonderful well that I can drop a bucket into anytime I want and come up with fiction, with a story. Because talk about characters, man, we got those. We got plenty. It's like sometimes you'll talk to another Texan, they go, they're telling you something, oh, I don't believe that. Where'd that happen? He said, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I can see that. You know, because they can. Um, sometime back, I wrote an article for the Texas Observer, and uh, it kind of covers some of that ground, and I brought it here to kind of... Uh, you know, read a little bit of that for you, because I think it's going to touch on a lot of this stuff. And if you're easily offended, I'm sorry. I really am. It was in a Texas Observer, though, so it wasn't that bad. Um, noir is a French word meaning dark. It's a term used to identify a certain type of grim fiction or film. Don't let the French name fool you. 
There's plenty of noir right here in East Texas. Though it's mixed with Southern Gothic, and Western, and all manner of stuff, it's a gumbo boiled in hell. I know, I'm from East Texas, I've seen it, I've written about it, and you know what? Weird as some of it is, fictionalized as the work is, it comes from a wellspring of true events you just can't make up. Let's clear this part up. There are plenty of good people in East Texas. I saw one yesterday. <laughs> but if you're a writer of crime fiction, why, which I am at least some of the time, you're not looking for the good people. You're looking for the weirdos, the criminals, the malcontents, and the just plain stupid. That's your meat if you write crime. In spite of the word, not all of the fiction or films associated with this genre are completely dark. Noir wears many hats. Some may even have a bright feather in them, and sometimes noir can laugh, which is where I come in. It's where East Texas comes in. You can't point at noir and call it any one thing in spite of an attempt to label it, but it usually has some of these elements. Existentialist attitude, cynical and desperate characters, wise-ass talk, rain and shadows, a lightning bolt and shadow blind, sweaty sheets and cigarette smoke, whiskey breath and dark street corners where shots are fired and a body is found, long black cars squealing tires as they race around poorly lit corners. But for me, as a writer, noir takes place in the back rows in the slick brick streets and red clay roads and sandy hills of East Texas. For me, noir is about stories that have to do with Baptist preachers claiming with lilting poetry to be called by the Lord to preach the word. But their intentions are as false as a stuffed sock in a rock star's pants. <laughs> Pretty soon they're gone with the congregation money and three deacons' wives are knocked up. <laughs> For me, it's stories about the deep backwoods and small town girls with inflated dreams and big blonde hair. <laughs> And the kind of oozing sex appeal that would make a good family man set fire to the wife's cat and use it as a torch to burn down his house <laughs> with his wife in it. You got your slick back, shiny haired used car salesman with more better deals and a plan to set fire to his business for the insurance money. You got your muscle arm pod bellied hick with a toothpick and a John Deere gimme cap forever dressed in hunting boots, camouflage pants, and a wife beater t shirt. Even if his destination is just the barber shop or the barbecue joint. He's the kind of guy who likes to get drunk every night and drive home weaving. He's the kind of guy whose last words are to his best buddy in the passenger seat, hey, hold my beer and watch this. <laughs> then proceeds to unzip his pants and attempts to drive his truck with his manly appendage. <laughs> you got this same kind of guy at the Wednesday prayer meeting wearing a concealed carry pistol tucked carefully under his worn out high school leather jacket just in case the Muslims attack by parachuting in, or there's an unexpected run on grape juice and tasteless wafers by liberal Democrats. <laughs> He's the kind of guy who carries a pack of condoms in his front pocket to signify a high host for the big-breasted blonde church organist with an orthodontist grin and an ass like two volleyballs banging together in a croaker sack. <laughs> And if that don't happen, well, hell, on his way home, he's got a spotlight and a rifle in the trunk for popping blinded rabbits. In fact, in the trunk, he's got so many guns, his guns own guns. And who knows where that kind of firepower might lead. For example, there are those guys down at the job that done him wrong, the ex-wife that got the kids, the dog that digs in the yard, and all those folks who want the new health care purpose so they can pull the plug on Grandma! They could all get a taste of his ammunition. The mood strikes him right. You got the Aryan nations with their pale skin smacked full of jailhouse tattoos, crosses and swastikas, a heart with mama written across it on a crawling snake. Their necks so covered up in tattoo print they look like they fell asleep on a damp newspaper. Talking authoritatively with tears in their eyes about the Bible they've never read. Cussing science and man-made books. Then you got the Dixie flag, Southern Heritage guys talking about how fine it would be had the South won the war, worrying that they're losing their white heritage, which when you get right down to it, is most likely great grandpa's weed infested grave, a mayonnaise sandwich on white bread, a moon pie, a bag of pork skins, a big Bud Light, and a Jim Beam chaser. <laughs> Here in East Texas, we got rampaging horse shooters. This happened in Nacogdoches recently. Wife beaters, child abusers, murderers, gangs, yeah, really, gangs. Scripture quoting psychopaths and enough crystal meth that if some cooker gets drunk and drops a match, they could blow us all the way to the red planet Mars. <laughs> the people I write about lurk in small East Texas town, living in same alike houses and on clear clay lots with little anemic bushes planted in their yards, yards that often sport mossy yard gnomes and colorful wooden frames painted up like bent over grannies. Y'all got some of them, don't you? <laughs> 
In the backyard, the flowers may even be holding down that missing relative not seen since 1985. Or their freezer might contain a human head next to a plastic bag of hot dog weenies. All this stuff has happened, guys. Let's come back to this as it might save me from a lynching. Yes, East Texas is full of good people. Some of those good people might even be Christians. Some of them might even be used car salesmen and back road runners wearing camouflage with a toothpick in their mouth. They might be a public servant so paranoid he wants a college student to be armed. So in case of a nut going wild, the armed students can kill the nut and each other in a crossfire. <laughs> but is otherwise a good person with the best of intentions. Not everyone is out to do bad. Some have done well with their GED. <laughs> and they have a nice library, primarily consisting of guns and ammo magazines, and others where naked women wear only staples. Seriously, I even know one person who has been to Clown College and graduated. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about. These are my peeps, man. Sometimes you look at noir and realize it's real, not just a story or a film, and some of it is so like a sucking gunshot wound to keep from hanging yourself from a shower rod, you have to laugh at it, make fun of it. You got to do what firefighters and policemen do, and when I speak of the latter, I don't mean senselessly beating a suspect with three feet of water hose and a telephone book. I mean laugh at the terrible things, because laughter is the only antidote to this stuff. It's the 800 pound gorilla that holds the dark at bay. My noir may not be your noir, but nonetheless it is noir. And though it's not all I write, it's a lot of what I write. And it influences a lot of the other things I write. It informs work of mine that I'm meant to be absolutely as far away from noir as I'd like to be from the Tea Party. East Texas has its own kind of, I'm making people mad, I hope. Uh -huh. <laughs> East Texas has its own kind of dark side that comes deep fried, baptized, and sanctified with a side of hollow points and racial epitaphs. That's my beat right here in the shadows of the sticky heat nestled up tight as a hungry chigger in a fat man's armpit. <laughs> when you write crime, you're not looking at the good that exists. You're thinking about and looking at the bad, at the criminals, at the lowlifes, and how they affect those who just want to do their part. People who just want to do their jobs, raise their families, and maybe retire with a lakefront view and a good supply of adult diapers for their old age with no one cooking crystal meth next door, in fact, kicking in the door to take their new plasma television set or sell their crippled dog to medical research. But those folks are out there like the flu, waiting. They are outnumbered by the good. But all it takes is one bad sucker to ruin your day. We all know that therein lies the appeal of the noir tale. The books of mystery, suspense, crime, sacrifice, a trip to the Dairy Queen gone horribly wrong. <laughs> Stories like that are a way to flirt with the dark without having to actually date and marry him. <laughs> we know bad can happen, but most of we like to think we're pretty safe in our bedroom at night with a book in our hand. We can turn the pages and see what happens, or we can put it down, turn off the light, and go to sleep. But on some level, it's like an inoculation against disaster, pre-coping with things that might happen and probably never will. A metaphorical way of dealing with the big D, and I don't mean Dallas, I mean death. That part will happen, be it by crime, poorly chewed steak, lodged in the windpipe, car wreck, or lying in an old folks' home wired up like a spaceman watching shadows move across the wall. Noir is our way of saying howdy to the dark side without going there to live, at least not just yet. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate it. And like I said, East Texas, it has good people. It does, I've, I've met some of them. Now and again. So anyway, thank you very much. Oh, so um, Jacob's dad, Henry, was really nervous about us setting off from this, you know, going down the river, not really knowing what the conditions were like. So he found a little chunk of concrete rubble, you know, just big enough, like the size of a football. And he said, here, I'm going to put this in the boat. And then when you guys come by the bridge, if I'm not there, set it out on the bank so that I can see it. And I know that you went by and you're safe. It was 
completely ridiculous. But, you know. <laughs> it's a terrific book, by the way. You, you really should read it. It's absolutely terrific. And, and uh, like I said, those are my peeps. Those are the people mm -hmm. I just yeah. Yeah, yeah mine too. Uh, Joe and I grew up, well, I guess, many years ago, but probably, Watch less than five, <laughs> <laughs> probably less than five miles away. Yeah. I'm, I'm suddenly the moderator, I guess. <laughs> uh, where were people like William Wayne Justice fit into your... William Wayne Justice, I actually had uh, a personal event with, so to speak. When I, in 1970, I went to Tyler Junior College, and my hair was a little long for that time, and they would not let me register. So I had an injunction against the schools called... Uh, Lansdale et al. versus TJC. And Judge Wayne Justice was our judge. And it was a big, big trial. A lot. And you know, you can you go back and look at the newspapers, there's pictures of people, the judge, me, and everybody. And uh, um, so one day I remember as he's hearing all of these arguments on both sides, that uh, and their argument was that because we had long hair that we were basically stupid. Which it, it could have been something. <laughs> but but we were all on like I was on the dean's list and you know at that time I was waiting till it was all over so I could just go to hell you know but, but yeah I was on the dean's list one other guy was like uh, even more so he had like almost a straight 4.0 and I had near that and the other guy I think he had a pretty good average too so they lost that argument well one day Judge Wayne Justice showed up in court he was wearing a Beatles wig <laughs> and I thought I think we're gonna win this one <laughs> and we did. And uh, so that's my association with Judge Wayne Justice. And, and, and uh, Judge Justice said in many uh, articles and interviews later that that was the most important trial that he ever attended to because it was a civil rights trial. And he used that not only so people could wear their hair longer, but he used the civil rights for blacks, Hispanics, whatever. You know, anytime it was civil rights, that particular trial was something that he could use as a basis for it's happened before, sort of thing. So, so funny you should ask about him because I had that association. Well, he was a hero. Who were your heroes? Well, he was after that. <laughs> <laughs> my dad was my hero. My mom, my parents were my heroes. I mean, they they had their faults. You know, like I've got I got one or two, but you know, everybody has them. But they were bright people. They were very wonderful people. So, and other than that, it was writers a lot. It's like a Mark Twain's a hero, Flannery O'Connor. Uh, I loved her work, and I, I still do Ray Bradbury. I mean, I could get this Richard Matheson. I could start this list, and it starts to get longer and longer. You know, I liked all of these people as writers, and and, and sometimes, it, you know, in biographies I read, sometimes the people that, so Mark Twain to me is one of the most interesting people that ever walked the earth, you know. So I, I've got a far larger list, but my father and mother mainly, my father, when I was uh, 11, started teaching me boxing and wrestling. And so I got interested in it. By the time I was 13, I was doing judo. As of this month, I've been doing martial arts 52 years. I'm starting to get long in the tooth, but I'll surprise you. <laughs> I just taught a martial arts camp this last weekend, and I'm going to Indiana to teach a, a seminar because I'm, I'm in demand for that. And I founded a system called Xin Chuan. And that system now has followers, and it has people that will be taken over after me. Uh, but all of that was from all of that, my father teaching me boxing and wrestling and encouraged me. And also he encouraged me to be a writer because I wanted to do that. From the time I could first remember wanting to do anything, it was writing. And I was probably four years old or something. I was writing and drawing comic books. And I became a writer because I couldn't draw very well. And the writing was so much more appealing to me. you know. So I started doing that. And then by nine, I had written a story and all that. But my dad and my mother, always encouraged me. My mother was a big reader, and so she was always putting books in my hand and comic books. And comic books are the most important thing I ever read because they excited me. They caused me to say, Jill, this is great. Now I want to read other things. So I'd have to say that they, and then if I go beyond that, and I'm not just saying this because she's here, my wife is my hero. She really has been, I, I couldn't have made it as a writer had it not been for her. Uh, I mean, I was always not somebody that needed the cheerleader much. I'm not like that. I'm pretty confident, and that comes from martial arts. But there were times, and like my wife telling me, just take this three months off and write. And not many wives are going to do this. They say, well, what do you mean you're not working? <laughs> Maybe you can get some part-time work out at the film station. And I don't blame them. But I'm just saying she didn't do that to me. 
And she's always believed him. And there was never a time, not one time she ever said, maybe y'all not, you know, be doing this. And of course I was working other jobs too. I mean, I wasn't, you know, sitting on my butt. Just those, but those three months were important. And then I worked as a janitor and I, I was a bouncer. I did all kinds of jobs for many years. And then when I was 29, I think I was just short of being 30, uh, I was able to go full time. And it would look great. I mean, those, and then it collapsed. And then, I, but I, I, I fought my way back up. And uh, by 86, when she was born, I knew I was going to have to have money. I just, we sensed it. So the career started moving much faster. But, but uh, uh, yeah, yeah. But, but really, those people are my heroes. I mean, I, it's a roundabout way of answering the question, but that's good. I think somebody had a question over there. Oh, there it is. In the back. Uh, Joe, I, I did some field research in East Texas, and I went to school out of Nacogdoches. All right. But I can't tell you, the layer of layer upon layer of local color, and I was somewhere, a little town, somewhere, it's 5 o'clock on a Friday, and it's obviously everybody had gotten paid, right? Yeah. So I was, the local convenience store was filled with people betting on the lottery and you know, stock it up. But the guy in front of me had his shoulders like this. <laughs> and he had a wall up in his back pocket with a big chain on the back of it, right? <laughs> and then I turned around this other African American lady, she was in her pajamas, right? <laughs> T shirt that said sexy or something like that. <laughs> she had flip flops on and pajamas. And then the, this guy with the hunting dogs comes in, right? He's got a pickup truck full of hunting dogs. And I said, I, this is this is just one layer after the Right. It was so cold. It, it's really deep in East Texas. The dogs are driving when they come out. <laughs> yeah. but, you, you know, one of the things that, that East Texas it influenced me, and it, it sounds like I'm just talking negatively about it, and I'm not, but when you're writing crime, uh, uh, you know, that's what your slant is a lot of times, crime fiction or whatever, that's what you see. It's great people live, you know, in East Texas too. But <laughs> when I was growing up in Gladewater, Texas, the thing that influenced my writing a tremendous amount was racism. It just, it upset me, you know, even when I was young, I thought, I don't know, I don't quite get this, you know. You, you grow up with it, and at first it seems natural. But one time I was going to a, uh, uh, the Cozy Theater in Gladewater, Texas, and they had a stair on the outside, and uh, black people were going up the stair, you know, as they called them then, the colored when they were being polite. And believe me, they frequently were not polite. And I, I was with my mom, she was taking me to the movies. And, and I said, Mom, why do those people have to go up there? And I remember she said to me, she said, you know what? I don't know what to tell you because it's not right. And it, all, it won't always be that way. And I never, never forgot that because it was, you know, I won't say that in that moment everything turned, but it was a moment among moments that made me realize you know, this. <laughs> And when I was growing up as a kid, when, and, and I was, later we lived in, uh, Mount, before that we lived in Mount Enterprise, I would go downtown, and there used to be an old wagon yard there. There were still some people who had wagons. You know, I was probably six, seven years old. And I would go there, and a lot of the older black men would sit there and talk, and I would just come up and, you know, I was always the guy that was listening. And they were, you know, really sweet, because they, they let me, you know, they didn't go, go away, kid. And they, I listened to these stories they told, and I, but what I noticed, and this, this affected me a lot, is that they were very nice to me sometimes in a way that I thought was, you know, a kid didn't deserve that much, you, you know, like they treat me like I was a man. But I would also notice that they didn't talk the same way when white people came up. When I was sitting there, they'd come up, then all of a sudden they'd go into this shuck and dry thing because that's how they survived. But I, I, I've sensed that, and, and we're talking about 19, early 1960s. And so all of that offended me deeply. And that's why so much of my work is so anti-racist. People ask me why that is true. And uh, I mean, it should be obvious why, but it seems to be a, a, a strong theme in a lot of books I've written. I've had people say, well, you know, you really, you've written about that before, you don't need to write about that again. I said, well, you know what? That's what I remember, that's what I experienced, and I don't think it's all gone now. You know, people like to pretend it is. When you get around a lot of the people who are telling you, well, I haven't got anything against them, like, you know, like that, and then you start listening to them, and they always think I'm a redneck, too, because I look like one. And then I start hearing the N-word. Yeah? And, you know, it ain't changed that much. It's changed better. It's way better. I remember when they had water fountains that said colored. I remember when, 
you know, you had uh, uh, bathrooms that were colored. I remember when they had the, the, the show, like I was telling you about, that you had the, the stairs, they had to go up. You know, I remember that. I remember when you watched a TV show, there weren't any black faces unless they were clowning, you know, or, or perhaps performing. And, I, and, and you know, it's not just black, you know, but that was the area where I was. Where Karen grew up, it would probably be more, uh, you know, Hispanic, uh, Latino, but, but where I grew up, it was primarily black. And, and that really affected me. To this day, when I see something about the civil rights stuff, I, I have a hard time not crying because I know how people were brutalized and how people, oh, we all just got along. I've heard people say, they stayed over there and we stayed over here. No, they did not all get along. I knew people that drove down to the black section of town because they had their own section. And they would come down at night and catch somebody on the road and jump out and beat them up because they were good black guys. They'd tell you about it and brag about it. Like four guys jumping on one guy was like a, you know, that was really funny. That was really a, a wonderful brag. Bill Paxton told me, he said uh, he was raised a lot by his uh, mammy, is what they called her, mammy, when he was growing up. And he said that, you know, he would, when he, after he got grown and went to Hollywood and became an actor, he'd go stay with her when he'd come back. That's who he stayed with. But he said one time he was walking, and there was, this is around Fort Worth, and there was like a wall. I don't know, little wall, big wall, what? And he kept, he said, I wonder what that wall is. He got, got one, and then finally it just dawned on him, the obvious. It was the separation of black side of the, town and the white side at that particular spot you know because i remember he and i were talking about because he's supposed to direct my film my book the bottoms the film of it which is about racism of the 1930s but we grew up a little later than that and bill's younger than i am but still you know that was there and if people really look it's it's still there it's better it's way better i think i think it's turning the big corner but you know you got to keep turning the wheel keep doing it. Sorry, I went off on all that. <laughs> Anybody else? Adrian Peterson, who is the running back for Minnesota, has been in the news lately for cruelty. Uh, he's been accused of cruelty to his child. He's a East Texan Palestinian. Mm -hmm. so is, when you, as East Texans, hear about that, you think, well, that was business as usual. It, it, Adrian's comment was, well, you know, when I was going, I didn't get any spanks but one. My mom whipped my butt with a fly swatter until I thought I was going to die, and I felt I deserved every minute of it. But, you know, my parents weren't, they, didn't, they weren't brutalized. But, but yeah, but, I, I mean, I've known plenty of people who got spankings that didn't turn out to be horrible people. But there's a difference in patting a little kid, but don't put your finger in that light switch because they don't have that same reasoning ability. But that doesn't mean you have to spank them. I mean, everybody's got to make that decision. So I don't know much. I've heard about that. I don't know what degree that means. Or, but most of the time, I think it's a totally unnecessary thing, you know. If, if I had it to do over, I wouldn't have beat Casey as much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, she came out all right. So the so the son. <laughs> Kids getting whipped? <laughs> well, I heard from a reader who um, who said she knew like what sandbar she could play on, and if she got too far into the river, then you know her mom would say, "Pick a switch," which meant mm -hmm. go. Oh yeah, well the people do that all the time when I was growing up. I, you know, you know, like I said, a lot of those people we were bad people. That's the way it was done then, you know. The, but there was a difference in people like the, my father's father who took a horse whip. And beat that that's beating. That's not, you know, don't get in the fire, you know. Or, uh, or you know, you move the kid's hand two or three times and they keep putting it there and then you pat them on the butt. Well, that's not exactly a beating. You know, that's keep them what's gonna happen to them is worse than what than that, and rationalization doesn't work at a certain age, you know. So and yeah, corporal punishment is uh, you know very common and it's a tradition that's ongoing in East Texas, but I haven't seen I mean anything like Adrian Peterson's son. I mean, if, I mean, that's horrific yeah, no matter yeah. where it occurs. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I'm not saying that's confined. But I know people who still think that. I know a guy was telling me the other day, where was I? I just, just heard the story. He was talking about uh, that his um, friend's father, when he got out of line, that he would hit him with his fist. I mean, fist fighting. And he said, when you get big enough to whip me, you come back. You know, and the, and the kid, over the years, I think because it wasn't exactly the best home life, 
tried it several times, you know. And uh, I just was, I, I'll tell you a story, and I won't name names very briefly, is that when I was a kid, there was a, a, a kid that was a friend of mine, but his father just beat him unmercifully. And he was at our house one time, and there was, it was horrible, just, you know, welts and stuff. And my dad said, son, what happened to you? He said, well, my daddy corrected me. He said, corrected you? What do you mean he corrected you? Well, he took a strop or a belt or something, I don't remember, and whipped me with it. He said, all right. So when we took the kid home, we dropped him off, and my dad called the guy and said, hey, come here. And the guy would come, you know, come over, and he says, you see those bruises on that boy? I said, yeah. He said, if I ever see that boy again, or he even says anything to me, or my boy mentions it again, I I'm going to do just what you did to him, except I'm going to break a bone. You know, and that guy and, and that kid till the day the last he got killed, he became a criminal and, you know, got killed in a motorcycle accident. But till the day he said his father never laid a hand on him again. The thing about my father is that he grew up rough. I mean, you know, people say, you know, you don't want to solve things through violence. But I think a lot of times they had no choice. You know, they had no choice because of the environment they were in. And my dad was a good guy, but he didn't put up with with that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, he was the kind of guy that had a reputation around town, you know, great guy, but do not, do not try to hurt him or his family or whatever, because he's not going to stand for it. Because like I said, he was born in 1909. He grew up with a whole different way, the way people handled themselves. So. Steve. Hey, Wes, I want to ask, you grew up in East Texas, in East Texas, you came to Austin for college, kind of a different environment. That change how you felt about East Texas whenever you go back to visit? Yeah, it did. Uh, even more so, I think that the documentary Hands on a Hard Body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, you know, the 12 guys are, you know, however many people have to keep their hand on the pickup truck, the last one standing wins the truck. And, you know, I grew up outside of Longview and I would, you know, drive past the, the contest going on and, um, you know, never stopped or anything. And I never even saw the narrative possibilities of East Texas. I didn't know. I, I knew these people. Find somebody every day. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and I, I didn't come to Joe's work until until later on. And so that documentary, when you see these people losing their minds, and also showing great compassion and, wow. and just being really funny, that's when I began to see East Texas uh, for the storytelling possibilities. And you know, coming to Austin and being exposed to that was really important for me to be able to put some distance between myself and my, you know, my friends and relatives and everything. So yeah, yeah, you don't know it's weird until you go somewhere else. Right. <laughs> yeah. Here we have a question for Casey. We've heard how Joe and Wes write their stories. How do you go about writing your songs? Thank you. Um, <laughs> It sort of depends because when I write alone, I mean, for example, Edge of Dark Water was something I had the title already there. I knew that that was going to be the hook and I wanted to build a story based on that. And, uh, and when you write in Nashville, you do a lot of songwriting that is hook based. You have a hook, you, you write the chorus around it, and then you fill in the story. And that's very standard, um, you know, the Nashville way. But when I'm alone, I tend to write songs from top to bottom like a story. I think obviously growing up in a literary household, it makes sense to me to try to suss it out in three and a half minutes, top to bottom. But um, you know, there's there's a lot of people who they they have a different method. A lot of people always start with the chorus, and and that's supposed to be your your strong point. But I prefer when it's just me, just doing it like a you know a story I'm trying to tell you. And you know, I do country music, and I try not to uh, have tractors and dirt roads, and, <laughs> you know, and have have a real story there even. The single that I have, Sorry Ain't Enough, it's, there's a music video that just came out and it's been picked up and it's really exciting, but um, a lot of people, what their comment has been is, yeah, you did it in a fun, kind of tongue-in-cheek way, but there's a real story there from the beginning of this relationship to the end, so that's my, that's my process. <laughs> but each, each song kind of has a, a different way that it wants to come out and it sort of dictates to me how it wants to be exposed. Gallery, 
yellow writers and, and songwriters and say, you have a, you have a, pub, a public in mind, and the, I assume the goal is to sell, right? And does that affect what you do um, a lot, a little? Well, I come from the Lansdale School, so <laughs> uh, I, it definitely affects me um, de more than this guy, for sure. But uh, you know what? I was going to Nashville. I was kind of commuting back from Texas to Tennessee, and I had been there for a long time, and I was writing, and I wasn't really coming out with a product that I felt good about. Even though I thought the products were good and the people I was working with were extraordinary, I didn't really have a connection to it. And when I finally just said, you know what? I quit Nashville, I don't even care. That's kind of when the best stuff came out. And I think that's true of any art is when you quit trying to worry about what everybody's perception is gonna be. And um, as he had said, I wrote that novel. And when I wrote that novel, I kept thinking, oh my God, people are gonna read this. <laughs> and you know, I was like, my mom's gonna read this, my dad. And so you, know, you, you find this way to, to sugarcoat things. And there was something that my dad always says, um, write like everybody you know is dead. And when I wrote the novel, that made sense to me for the first time. I mean, on a logical place, I understand. But to actually be in there, because there were moments where I go, well, what would my whatever it is think of this? And then once I realized, like, meh, who cares? Um, the art kind of was released. Yeah, I, I know that I speak for Wes, he'll speak for himself, but I just know that I write for me. And it's not that I don't care if people like it, I just don't write for them. I mean, because everybody, everybody here has got a different view. If you don't like my stuff, hey, I can live with it. And if you do, I'm... I'm right, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm gratified, you know, if somebody loves and if they don't, they don't. But when I write, I really write for me, because I learned that was a turning point for me, is I just don't care what you want. And then when I'm done, I say, oh, they like it. <laughs> but, but not while I'm... Not I care a little bit. Yeah, you care a little, a little more than I do. That's obviously. But yeah. country music. When you're a performer and, and you're up there, there's light on you. Yeah. yeah, it's a different. I mean, as a writer, I actually prefer the process of writing much more than I do the performance side of it because I normally I have a band or I have um, I've been on radio tour with just myself and another person. And when you're a writer, it's really cool because it's you and the computer, and that's it. That's really all that's involved. When you're doing the sort of musical career that I'm doing, there's you, there's the co-writers, there's the musicians, there's the producer, there's the manager, there's the publicist, and all of those things are elements in the writing world, but it's after the work is created. And that's what we see in archives, which is so interesting, because then you, you get not only do you get the writers, um, you know, process and, and that sort of, but then you see what happens to it afterwards, and that's why that's so. Yeah, and film's even worse because film you got all these different oh, people. Like I've written a lot of screenplays and, and things. There's a point when when uh, I mean in fact I had just my agent just the other day, these guys were trying to negotiate with stuff, and he says, wait a minute. He said, I, I know that you used to do in Hollywood. He said, This guy ain't like that. He really he's from East Texas and he really don't care. He ain't gonna do it. <laughs> so if you want to do it, fine. If he don't, he's fine. And that's true. You know, I said, Yeah, now you know, now you finally got it right. So so that's how you got so I was curious about the novels movie and film. How is that it for you as a Well, I mean, I didn't do the screenplays on these, so that helps, you know, and so I didn't have to. But I'm actually very pleased that everything of mine has been filmed. I'm very unusual in that way and that I've been lucky. I mean, I'm waiting for the next big, you know, Bill Paxton better not mess up or I will kill him. <laughs> but but uh, he's a Texan. He better not do it. But, but I have several other things. Uh, there's a thing with Peter Dinklage, the Game of Thrones guy that, uh, yeah. from my novel, The Thicket, and he's supposed to star in it. So, like, yeah, I saw a picture of him. So yeah, right. He's supposed to start it, but I don't know what's happening. See, I'm not, I'm not at this point producing that one. I may. I've been a producer on several other things. Sometimes that's just a name, and you get a name. But the way I've always done it is I get money. And then if I get, and then I try to have as much say as I can. But ultimately, they can say, we're going to do what we want. But Wes, what about you? Do you have you approach it when you're writing? Well, I'm a little different because most of my professional background is all in journalism. Are you an editor for the Yeah. Yeah, uh, my book was from Texas A&M, so I had an editor there. Um, a lot of it, you know, when I'm writing, I started as a sports writer, and everything I wrote had to be commercially viable because I had to, I needed, you know, the next assignment. Um, and so now that I'm, I'm starting to write books, 
it's uh, I feel like it's um, somewhere in between. You know, like the first draft is all about me and it's what I want and what I enjoy. And then when I'm revising, that's when I start thinking, okay, well, you know, what's my uh, grandma gonna think about this? You know, what's my editor gonna think about? And then trying to translate, you know, what was in my head into something that will, um, you know, communicate to all, of, all the other people. Let's do one more question. We've got one right here. Go to our book site. Uh, well, this is a good last question down the line. What's next for you guys? Two weeks ago, I turned in the first draft of my next book, which is about the Blanco River here in Hayes County. series that I have and I'm about halfway done with that right now and I'm working on a screenplay with my son and I'm working on a novella with my daughter and I'm trying to actually direct my first film eventually here if I can get everything to get. I, I don't sleep. I don't need it. <laughs> no, I just get up, get it done and then move on. Well, I'm busy. <laughs> And uh, well, I'm as he mentioned, I'm on vocal rest. And because when you tour for nine months, apparently um, you need to take some time off. So, <laughs> but everything kind of kept snowballing. So they kept sending me back out on the road for the radio tour. But um, I will be in nothing but stretchy pants for hopefully two months. And then I start the new tour. We're turning one of his works into an off-off-Broadway play. We're working on a novella right now. I just started my second novel, so I plan to keep busy in the time. Yeah, Casey produced some plays, uh, two plays out in Los Angeles with Thomas Jane and one based on one of my things. So she doesn't sleep much either. <laughs> Our son, he gets plenty of sleep. <laughs> he's a hard worker, but he's like, no, no, I don't. Yeah, I'll take it. Great.